Good evening. I'm Professor Berlin Kobion, and I would like to welcome you all to our spring semester's first event of the Writing Culture Speaker Series on behalf of the English 801 Multicultural Cohort. The Writing Culture Speaker Series was established to supplement our English 801 cohort with events focused on our theme of multiculturalism. Today, we are honored to have Mothership Editors Bill Campbell and Ed Austin Hall, as well as author of Madhu and the Sal Saltwater African, Lisa Bolekaja, as our guest speakers. We look forward to hearing their perspectives on diversity in science fiction. Thank you to the Student Equity Committee for sponsoring this event, to our English department head and multicultural cohort co-leader, Dr. Rodney Rodriguez, for his continued support in putting on the speakers series, and thank you to librarian Ward Smith for proposing this fantastic idea and for all the work you've done in organizing it. Lastly, thank you to our LBCC students in attendance. We hope that you're inspired to set forth on any path your heart desires and not allow any systemic factors to deter you from achieving your goals. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk about yeah, systemic factors, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I know what I'll be doing tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce all the speakers we're here today. Uh, some of them are going to tell us how they got here. Uh, some are going to read from their work. Some will do a, do a combination of both, and there'll be a question and answer period afterwards, as well as uh, just a getting to know each other period. So stick around. I'd like to introduce the three uh, uh, authors today uh, in reverse order uh, presentation. First of all, Bill Campbell. Uh, Bill Campbell is the author of Sunshine Patriots, My Booty Novel, uh, Pop Culture, Politics, Puns, Pooh Butt from a Liberal Stay-at-Home Dad, and the infamous Coontown Killing Caper. Along with Edward Austin Hall, he co-edited the groundbreaking anthology Mothership, Tales from Afrofuturism and Beyond. In 2015, he also edited Stories for Chip, a tribute to Samuel R. Delaney with Nisi Shaw and APB, Artist Against Police Brutality, with Jason Rodriguez and John Jennings, who's also the artist who uh, gave us this great graphic here to work with. Uh, Campbell lives in Washington, D.C., where he spends his time with his family, helps produce audiobooks for the blind, and helms the uh, company Rosarium Publishing. Edward Austin Hall uh, is an Alabama escapee. We have that in common. Uh, and lifelong Southern Edward, Aust Southern Edward Austin Hall, co-edited with novelist Bill Campbell, the anthology Mothership, Tales from Afrofuturism and Beyond. He also wrote the profile of cartoonist Alison Bechdel that appears in the Dictionary of Literary Biography, American Radical and Reform Writers, second series. He created the Supervisions blog, which examined feminism and other matters through the prism of comics and comics-related media. For Fresh Loaf, his essay on life near the middle of the Kinsey scale appeared in its parent publication, Creative Loafing Atlanta. As a writer, editor, developer in the role-playing game industry, Hall contributed to White Wolf's uh, Vampire, The Masquerade, and Werewolf, The Apocalypse, among others, and he co-created Hunter, The Reckoning. Other examples of his work have appeared in Paste and Code Z, Black Visual Culture Now, Excerpts from his StoryCorps interviews with Atlanta artists appear on his website, Burn Away. His recent poetry and short fiction appeared in the online journal I Drum periodically. His forthcoming first novel, entitled uh, Kimura Island, Hall holds a bachelor's degree in English literature from Tulane University. Uh, Anil Menon sadly could not be with us today, called away on an emergency, and uh, wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, Lisa Balakaja is our, other, our last guest and going to be our first speaker. Uh, she's a graduate from the Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Workshop and was named Octavia E. Butler Scholar by the Carl Brandon Society. She co-hosts a screenwriting podcast, the Hilliard Guest's Screenwriter's Rant Room, and is a staff writer for Bitch Flicks, an online feminist film review site. Her work also appeared in Long Hidden, Speculative Fiction from the Margins of History, and the Wiscon Chronicles, Volume 8, and the recent anthology, How to Live on Other Planets, a handbook for aspiring aliens. Let's give a big hand for our visiting writers and have a great time. Tonight. I, I purposely sat on this end because I thought I would be going last. You messed that up. And second of all, I should have been in your anthology. 
No, no, no. No, no. When, the, when I heard the submission, I thought, I didn't realize, I, I had missed the submission window and I was so sad, so it's okay. Um, as they said, my name is Lisa Bokaja. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in doing, first of all, how many of you in here are interested in becoming writers, period? Just, you think you might want to be a writer? Okay. Yay, my peoples. Oh yeah, you guys in the front too, yeah, yeah. So what I want to talk to you about is some of the things that are going on. We have these terms that we use all the time about futurism. There are many types of futurisms. One of the ones that I like to advocate for, of course, Afrofuturism, but also indigenous futurism because I am black native. So a lot of times people always think that futurism is just for a set few people, especially when you see a lot of movies where you don't see people of color in outer space and you think, we're not supposed to be there because we're not there. How many of you guys saw the movie, um, was it Interstellar? How many of you guys saw Interstellar? Okay, y'all remember the end of Interstellar when they finally made it off of Earth? Did y'all see me? No, you didn't. <laughs> because we weren't there. So a lot of times when we talk about futurism, the whole idea is putting yourself in the story. Uh, this year marks the 10 year anniversary of Octavia E. Butler. If you don't know who she is, she's a fantastic black feminist sci-fi writer. And uh, she died in 2006. And basically one of the reasons why she started writing, sci writing science fiction in the first place is because she wanted to write herself into the future. She wanted to see herself. So when we talk about identity and putting yourself in positions of power, a lot of times it's just seeing yourself visually. A lot of times when you don't see yourself, you feel disempowered, but by actually seeing yourself, seeing that it can be done, you can kind of envision yourself being there. I do a lot of things besides writing science fiction. I'm also on the, the steering committee of the Carl Brandon Society. This was created in 1999 by a bunch of sci-fi writers who decided that they wanted to see people of color banding together and showing their work, letting people know that we exist. The name Carl Brandon Society comes from a fictional black fan writer. There were two white guys in the 50s who created this imaginary black person and they would pretend and write these letters to different sci-fi magazines talking about, oh, I'm an awesome fan. Because the joke was black people really don't read science fiction or participate in that. But the joke was really on them because people thought this person was real and they actually started to vote him in on fandom sites and things. He was almost nominated for the secretary of some kind of science fiction club until the ruse was up. They said this person did not exist. So a bunch of writers decided to use that name to kind of, kind of be subversive in creating an organization that supports marginalized writers, people of color to get their voices out there. So we do a lot of things. The biggest thing that we do is the Octavia E. Butler Scholarship for Clarion. Have, has anyone ever heard of the Clarion Writers Workshop? Okay, it's like one of the premier science fiction, <coughs> fantasy, horror writers workshops. It was the workshop that Octavia E. Butler got her start. She found her voice there and one of the things she wanted to do was to make sure that people of color, poor people, because a lot of times when we talk about identity and marginalized people, we forget about poverty. We also forget about disabilities and things like that. Number one marginalized group in the world are disabled people. A lot of people always think things always have to do with race or gender. A lot of times it's things you don't even think about. So a couple of things I want to bring up is the idea that when you read the type of things that I write, I write a lot of sci-fi, I write a lot of horror. Um, there's a politics behind it. A lot of times there are people who write, and I know there's people in your anthology, Bill, who just write because it's fantastic stories and they just want to get it out there. I don't come from that viewpoint. The first time I realized that someone black could write sci-fi was when I first saw Octavia Butler's book on a bookshelf in a black bookstore, a black Latino bookstore that I was working at. And literally I was walking by and I'm like, what is this? here, and I saw that. So by seeing that, I thought, huh. I mean, I was a big Stephen King fan. Anything with Stephen King, I was down for it. But we never really see ourselves. So I wanna give you a couple of uh, books that are coming out for those of you who are interested in reading more about anthologies um, that are sci-fi that are really starting to look at other groups of people and putting themselves in the future. There's one called Latino, Latina Rising that's gonna be coming out pretty soon. Of course, Bill's Mothership Connections. There's Long Hidden. There's another one that's, come, that's out right now that you can get. If there's anyone in here who's of native descent, you can get Indigenous Futurisms. Uh, we, walk, we Walk at the Clouds. It's an excellent book to get to get an introduction to it. I don't wanna take up too much time because I really wanna hear you guys. 
and input because I can talk all day. But I just want to read one of my short stories that I wrote. I wrote this as an assignment when I first got into Clarion. My teacher said, you guys have to come in. They normally don't do this. You usually get to Clarion and then you write. But then he said, I need you to write the story, 500 words, not 501, not 499, 500 words. And it was due the first day we walked into Clarion. Now, when you get in Clarion, it's kind of a big deal because not many people get into it because it's really competitive. And like a lot of people who come out of Clarion really come out winning Nebulas, Hugo Awards. Um, I, on the other hand, am hard-headed. I had a party the night before to celebrate. So I had all my friends in my neighborhood. I lived in a predominantly black and Latino neighborhood. So we was partying for like hours and days. It was like four in the morning. The party started at like four in the afternoon. So we were eating, drinking, partying. I had to be at Clarion at UCSD by two o'clock that afternoon the next morning. So you know, I was four hours. So at four o'clock when the party was finally over, I went to the grocery store. And I don't know, I think I was, I needed some water, I guess. I was, I was dehydrated for some reason. And I ran into my sister's best friend, uh, my sister's brother actually. And it was like four in the morning. Now mind you, it was four in the morning, but it was still dark. And I said, uh, Glenn, what you doing in here? And he's like, well, you know, we're going out ninja fishing. I'm like, ninja fishing? What, uh, he calls it ninja fishing, because what they do is they go to the grocery store and they buy gizzards, and then they go fish in places they're not supposed to, because that's where the good fish are. So they go under the cover of darkness and Imperial Beach and different places they're not supposed to be, and they fish. So I just thought, I just fell out laughing, like ninja fishing, and then immediately went home and wrote the story really fast because it was due, and then I passed out and then woke up and turned it in. So I'm gonna read you a really quick story called Ninja Fishing. I apologize ahead of time for those of you, I mean, I know you're college students, so if there's any children in here, um, there might be a, a curse word or two, and uh, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna read it, I'm just letting y'all know, you can make your escape now if you want to, all right? But it's called Ninja Fishing, and it goes like this. Let me get to the beginning of it. <clears throat> As quiet as it's kept, my boy Biondro and I were the last people to see the industrial canal levee intact before it crumbled in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. For real though, we were out ninja fishing in the Lower Ninth Ward, you know, sneaking into places illegally and fishing where we weren't supposed to under the cover of darkness. We bought chicken livers and ice and then waited until midnight to roll out his truck. Scaling the levee wall, we transported our fishing gear along with a cooler full of bait and brew. Biondro brought thick fish netting draped around his shoulders in case, you know, we snatched up a baby gator. We made our way to a choice spot near the water where Biondro swore a catfish buck jump like they were second lining. Standing under a waning moon, we complained about our classes at Tulane. <laughs> Drank beer and talked shit, our usual fishing routine. Why, why do you want a, why do you want a car, Biondro asked me. To get women to move around town. You don't need a car in New Orleans, man. You're already pulling thirsty bitches with them dark gable looks. Shit, when I, when are the light-skinned men? When are the light-skinned Negroes coming back? Y'all just too greedy. You dark-skinned brothers is too greedy. I laughed. I took it as a compliment because for years I used to envy his green eyes and fair complexion. He belched and tossed another empty beer can over his shoulder. Shit, Biondro yelled. His pole was bent at an obscene angle, and his feet were dragged forward into the mud. The fuck, I said, grabbing his shirt. Don't let go, man. This don't feel like catfish. No shit, Sherlock. It had to be a gator. He'd, you know, he'd have to let the line, his new metal leader, and pole go. I flipped on my headlight. I saw a large fish thrashing in the water. My light, he yelled. I switched on his headlamp. Alligator gar, I said. See, gars were like prehistoric looking fish with heads like alligators and scales like armor plating. I once hit one with an action now and it actually sparked. True story, true story. Biondra pulled out the three foot gar and something attached to its back. The gar didn't move once it was on land, it was dead. The thing attached to its back had already killed it. Is that, is that a woman? Biondra asked. Protruding from the gar's back was a foot-long, bone-white spear. Gripping the spear was a toddler-sized, naked woman. She was bald and dark-skinned. Damn, she's got a fishtail, Biondro said. We stood gaping at her. She was breathing hard. Her eyes were twice the size of a human's and shark-eyed black. Biondro threw his netting over them. We should throw them back, I said. What kind of fucktard are you? We can sell this thing at an aquarium somewhere. What if she dies, I asked. He ignored me. 
Biancho kept her in his large tank in our second floor apartment. The tank covered a complete wall of the living room. We didn't have a big freezer, so you know, we sometimes we used the tank to hold our catches until we were ready to eat them. I named the creature Nola, duh, and she was stunning. She lived up the gar she killed that we threw in the tank with her. She would stab the gar with her spear, tear out a chunk of flesh, and eat it. Her teeth ended in jagged pink points. We tripped on the fact that we caught a mermaid. I mean, she didn't look like Disney Ariel with the flowing red hair and milky white skin. I mean, she was blue black, hypnotic. I spent nights meditating on her face. You know, she'd press her wide, flat nose against the glass and stare at us, study our every movement. That's when reports of Hurricane Katrina began. The gray, wet weather escalated with the storm that brewed offshore. We have to put her back, I said. We had fucked around not believing Katrina would hit. Like fools in California who don't believe in serious earthquakes, we were comfortable with our regular hurricane seasons, but I knew Nola had to go. She was smiling all the time. I mean, not some beautific, angelic, warm your soul smiling, but some scary, you gonna get your motherfuckers grinning. <laughs> the more she smiled, the worse the weather seemed to get. I mean, I know, you know, I, I mean, I know one had nothing to do with the other, but she was in that tank grinning and her own brown feces flighting in the fish tank with the last shreds of the gar, and I could feel the storm raging inside of her and raiding out, you know, it was raiding out towards us. When the roof shook with the howling of Trina's approach, Biondro took out his net and snatched Nola up. We rode back to the levee on gas fumes. The wind was screaming like a freight train and we were drenched with rain. We climbed the levee like idiots, shocked and frightened by the river water that had risen past our fishing spot and now slapped savagely against the levee. A surge of water spilled over the wall, causing us to slip a bit. Our jeans and sneakers were soaked with dark brown river water, but we kept our balance. Biondro tossed Nola back in. She disappeared under the canal water, and for a moment, the air around us grew calm. The rain became a slight drizzle. The water behind the levee churned with cold anticipation, but the bitch was holding up. I have never seen the water come this close to the wall before, B, I said. People are not gonna believe this shit, man, Biondro said, but when they see this, they gonna know we have something, he said. And I saw it in his hand, it was Nola's spear. Nola came back to the surface, stretched her body and stroked her smooth head. She stared at her hands and then glared at us. Give it back, I said. This is proof, throw it to her. Biondra ignored me and I watched Nola rear back her head and scream and I shit you not, I felt the vibration of her voice when it hit the skin on my face. Biondra and I scrambled back down the wall and ran to his truck. He was still holding on to Nola's spear. By the time we got back to our apartment, we knew we were screwed. The power was out and Biondra was out of gas. No one was getting out of New Orleans. If you didn't leave before the storm, you learned how to swim or not. Biondra and I made it onto the Interstate 10 and endured hell on the highway. Of course, you know, most of y'all know what happened to us down there. And I don't ninja fish anymore. Hell, I don't even fish at all. I won't go near water unless I'm bathing in it or drinking it. I don't know where Biondra is now. I, I once saw a picture of a red barge that crashed to the section of the levee that we tossed Nola from. Some people sued the owners of the barge and blamed them for the levee wall breaking. Katrina passed through New Orleans with sound and fury and left the city pretty much intact. And when the levees collapsed, we became a fishbowl of liquid death. But in my mind, Biondra and I had jacked her spear and Nola made us pay for our sin. For real though. Can y'all hear me? How many of y'all have actually seen or read any part of the Mothership Anthology? Okay, so, well, thanks everybody who hasn't for coming. So, you know what I'm gonna do? I was gonna read some fiction, but instead, I think I wanna read my piece of the introduction to you. Because I think it'll get, it gets a lot more at, who I am and why I'm sitting here. Only after the Sci-Fi Channel rebranded itself as S-Y-F-Y as Sci-Fi did I finally understand a connection I had long sensed between science fiction and blackness. My own physical ambiguity in a racial sense, people of almost every ethnicity you can think of have wondered or decided what I am taught me the truism that others like you when they presume you are like them. The confusion I fostered in white folk and black folk 
as I grew up in Mobile, Alabama during the 1960s and 70s, helped make me a writer by letting me know that few people outside my kin perceived me as like them. Fine, be that way. I retreated into science fiction, read way too much of it, studied its history, and met its creators. I read that the New York Times reputedly banned the reviewing of fantasy or science fiction in its weekday pages, the same New York Times that employed book critic Anatole Breuer, another racially ambiguous American of black ancestry under the impression that he was, well, something other than what he was. In certain precincts, always, if a work of art is good, i.e., if a critic likes it, it cannot be science fiction. Excuse me, sci-fi. Um, sorry, I meant S-Y-F-Y. <laughs> Similarly, years ago, a white bigot whom I had just met revealed himself amid our affable conversation after I identified myself as black. He said, you're not black. I laughed and walked away from him. When Bill Campbell invited me to be part of this project with its open arms, fantasticated tales by and or for and or about people of color approach, I knew the book I had been waiting a lifetime to assemble lay ahead of me. And now, here it is. I'm kind of a science fiction evangelist. For a lot of years, I actively disliked the term sci-fi, but now I know, because it used to be the term that people like folks at the New York Times, where they wouldn't review it, this was their dismissive term, because it kind of, it kind of makes science fiction a little less threatening. Now the kids call it sci-fi, so I'm cool with it. I came to this stuff reading comic books. I learned to read reading comic books, superhero comics, Batman, Superman, Fantastic Four. Moved into Tom Swift Jr., Johnny Quest. Uh, how many of you are interested in visual art? I have to show you something. Some things. You got it. Uh, why don't we start with um, so Afrofuturism is not just a literary movement. So uh, let's start chronologically with something that is um, futurist, but not so Afrofuturist. But I think you'll see why I want to start with it. The the trailer for Tetsuo. This is the most crap-brained movie 